everyone, I'm Rachel Poli with Ari Meglin and we're your hosts for the Merry Writer Podcast. We're on episode 62 and this week's question is, what is the process for creating and publishing an audiobook? Before we begin, don't forget to subscribe to the podcast wherever you're listening so you never miss a show. And if you enjoyed this episode, please give it a like. For this episode, we are joined by author Tori Ziegler. It is lovely to have you on the show. Thanks so much for joining us. Hello, thank you for inviting me. Tori, is this your first podcast or have you been on podcast before? Uh, actually, I was on one in October. So this oh, cool. is my second one. Oh, awesome. Perfect. Um, do you want to tell us a little bit about your writing background? Like what genre you write and how many books you've written and stuff? I have written more than 50 books, a mixture of poetry and children's stories. Um, children's stories focusing mainly on fairy tales, fantasy, and animal stories. I wow! I knew you. I knew you've had a lot of books out, but I didn't realize it was that many. That's amazing. Yeah, just a couple. <laughs> you you did say fifty. I did. Yes. Fifty. Well, seriously. Actually, oh my actually, gosh! It's, 50, it's actually fifty-five plus an <laughs> anthology that I was a, a part of. But yeah. <gasps> I'm really sorry, Tori, but that that is literally I'm gobsmacked, and I also feel really, really bad that I have not done half of the stuff I want to do, and you've got fifty. I'm I'm so far behind. We're so bad. Would, <laughs> would it make you feel any better to know that most of them are relatively short because they're aimed at children? That helps a little, but. <laughs> No, no, it doesn't. <laughs> but you know what? Writing for children is just as difficult as writing a novel. I'm sure. If not harder. If not yeah. harder. Because I people will argue that writing shorter stories is actually like more difficult than writing the longer ones. Yes. <laughs> That's amazing. Um, sometimes because you've got to like get f fewer words to say the same kind of thing. Right. But but then it depends really because some people it comes more naturally to write the shorter works i actually struggle with writing something novel length i get bored halfway through <laughs> that is totally fair everybody gets that sagging middle <laughs> some people can dig themselves out and others can't well the others right <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> I have to say though, it's like I, my two stories that are out are in anthologies and they were short stories and I am not a short story writer. I appreciate that sounds completely obvious that I am because that's what I've privileged, but I am, I, I could not, I really struggled to condense the whole story idea into like 7,000 words. And if I have, if I had tried, I could easily have made that like 80,000 words it was so difficult so the idea that you've written these shorter stories lots and lots of shorter stories is just oh, mind-boggling yeah it's um nine of those are poetry collections oh lovely of various lengths but the rest of them are stories of various lengths from ones that barely reach a thousand words to some that are around twenty thousand. Wow. wow. See, poetry can be difficult too. Mm. I tried poetry once and it was, that existed. <laughs> <laughs> That's all. <laughs> it went that well. <laughs> oh yes, totally. <laughs> <laughs> so you, so you obviously, you, you know, you, you do different things. I mean, a lot of the people we have on the podcast are very much like, a, I'm a romance writer, or I'm a fantasy writer. You do obviously do different things. Yeah, I aim my writing at children, apart from the poetry, which I just write it and it gets, gets published together. Yeah. But I've got, um, mostly it's various types of fairy tales and fantasy, but I've got a sci-fi story, a historical fiction story, um, a series about um, dealing with um, adjustments after losing sight. Yeah. But I want to ask, like, a number of those uh, books that you've published, they're in audiobooks as well, right? Um, actually, all of them are. Other than the anthology, which I didn't bother to do because it's done through somebody else, all of them are available in audio, paperback, ebook, and audio. 
Oh, awesome. All right. So I think that's a that's an excellent segue to dive into this topic, which is, I'll say again, what is the process for creating and publishing an audiobook? Um, audiobooks have increased so much. They're so they're so popular now within these past couple of years. Uh, so Tori, I'll ask you, do you think everyone should create an audiobook when publishing their stories? If they can, yes, for a number of reasons. Um, first of all, there's the popularity thing, as you mentioned, but also, um, and this is the main reason I wanted to do it, is it helps with accessibility because some people actually find it difficult to read in certain formats um, for whatever reason. And an audiobook gives them that way that they can enjoy your book um, if they struggle with whatever other format might be available. I totally agree, Tori. Um, my, my brother is dyslexic and I know when he was growing up, he really did not enjoy reading and everything. And yet he has really got into audiobooks. So he went from someone who was never interested in books or reading or anything like that. And then as audiobooks became more popular, he has started to listen to so many more. And it did make me think differently because I, I, think, I think you can kind of get into your own head and be like, well, I, I like some audiobooks. I prefer nonfiction in audiobooks because um, otherwise I can't always follow the story well because of the person's voice can sometimes stress me out depending on the type of, of like uh, non-fiction, uh, sorry, the type of fiction books. So I was like, oh yeah, I don't think there's any point for me to create audio books. And then obviously it's like, as you said, thinking outside of that and thinking, ah, actually the accessibility to other people, whether they struggle to read, whether they struggle with sight, whether they have a condition that makes it hard for them to, to, to even just hold a book or, or anything like that, or if they need the text size bigger, anything like that. And it does, it does, it opens up to a, bit, a bigger audience. So that's always a positive. Exactly. When I was younger, um, it was a lot easier for me to listen to an audio book than it was for me to read a print book. And of course, ebooks weren't around at that point. Mm -hmm. So I learned the importance of them from the beginning. And like my brother is um, also visually impaired and he's been blind since he was a toddler. Mm -hmm. So it was always either audio books or braille books and braille books are incredibly bulky not to mention, as a general rule, um, were expensive and difficult to get hold of. They're cheaper and easier to get hold of now, but mm. still not as easy to get hold of as um, audiobooks. And it for him, it was the main way to actually enjoy a book. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I mean, we could go on forever and talk about the whole ebook versus physical book versus audiobook, but I'm sure you guys know that people argue that audiobooks are not real reading. Like if you listen to an audiobook, you're not actually reading and it shouldn't count. And I find that to be such a stupid <laughs> argument because whether you're listening to the book or whether you're able to listen to the book with it in your hand and you follow along, it's, you're still reading, you're still getting the story and you're still getting that vocabulary and the literacy. You're just doing it in a different way. Even with um, reading something in the same format, you'd still process it in a different way because people do. Yeah. Well, yeah, that's the thing. Everybody learns differently. And it's just, it's awesome that audiobooks have that accessibility for so many other people. I noticed before the pandemic mainly that people were saying they were started to listen to audiobooks during their commute, usually while they were like driving. Uh, obviously, some people, if they're on the bus or a train, would have it, but you know, you can have a paperback. But they were using that kind of dead time, and like commuting is always dead time. And so, even if people enjoyed paperbacks or hardbacks, Audiobooks became more popular, I think, because they had these extra little ways of slipping in. You know, people had all these reading challenges and they were able to get more books read, uh, read because if they were struggling to find time during other parts of their life, you know, if you're working really long hours or you've got kids to look after or anything like that, they were able to slot in this extra reading time, if you will, by listening to audiobooks while commuting. And it's, it's kind of interesting that that's kind of, that started to happen, that you know, people who were like, oh, I don't really like audiobooks, got into them in those kind of ways. 
and um, so people would listening while doing housework and that kind of thing as well. Yeah, yeah. Hmm. Yeah, see, I mean, because for me, I don't listen to audiobooks all that much because I tend to tune them out. I mean, it's the same thing with podcasts, ironically enough. But I do think that if I did have a longer commute and there are days when um like doing housework and stuff, there are times where I'll put on a podcast or something and I do have a list of books that I want to listen to, not necessarily read. Like I want to, I want to listen to them. If it's, even if it's something that I've read before, I do want to give the audiobook a try. It's on my list. <laughs> <laughs> I think with that, let's bounce to the next question. So how do you go about creating an audiobook? Well, there isn't any one set way because it depends on the platform you intend using. But the general um, place to start is first you want to decide on the kind of narrator you want, the style and the kind of voice you want, because it really, really does matter. Mm-hmm. I've heard a lot of really bad choices for narrators, um, but it, you want to find one with a style that's going to suit your story. So you want to think about what that is before you even start. Okay. Um, well, once you've figured that out, you want to um, figure out exactly where you're going to publish. Um, I was doing all mine through ACX because they have a royalty share scheme and given how many books I have, it kind of made sense because costs even with low costs per hour because I'm being shorter, um, it really adds up. Um, so the royalty share scheme where myself and the narrator get part of the royalties, but I don't have to pay anything up front is a huge bonus. Oh. Um, but there are other places to do it. But wherever you decide to do it, you want to um, figure out where that is and get yourself all registered on the site then get your books listed and start auditioning for narrators. And don't just get overexcited and go for the first person who who auditions, unless you are positive they are the the right voice for your book. Um, But once you find that right voice, you want to contact them and make sure that everyone agrees on the terms, whether it be that they both, everyone agrees on the timeframe and the, royalty share scheme or whether you're paying a set amount and everyone's happy with the amount and um, get them to agree to your contract i'm not i don't know why i didn't think but obviously there would be a contract because obviously it's like a business deal that you're organizing with somebody else yeah if you do it through acx it's pretty simple because acx essentially takes care of it you send them the offer Um, they click whether they're going to accept or not, and they've automatically, through that, got a binding contract. Right, right. Um, But if you do it through something else, you might have to actually write up a contract yourself. Um, It depends on the way it's being done and the um, technique you're using and platform you're using to do it. Mm -hmm. Can I I be annoying and add an an extra question? (laughs) You can add as many questions as you want. <laughs> where, where do, where do you find your narrators? Where's like, is there a specific place that you personally have found, or um, do you put like a, a shout out and ask for narrators to come to you, and then you sort of like that's how you audition them? Um, you list them on the platform you're using, for example, ACX, and put it that it's open for auditions. Um, ah. Then you leave it there and um, people who are on ACX looking for auditions will find it. But I also share mine across social media um, to let narrators know that I am looking for somebody. And after I'd done a few, when I had a couple of narrators I really liked, I'd actually offer them the project first um, Mm -hmm. if I thought they'd be good for it. So you you list it and people will audition and whoever you like, you go with. Um, but you've, as you just said, you go back to previous people that you've liked and offered them the job first. Yes. So yes. have you actually like used ACX at all recently? Because you have so many books out. Like, do you just have like a list of go-to people now? Um, well, you can 
when you go on your ACX dashboard, you can access the narrators you used previously to contact them anyway. But also the ones that I've been in contact with via email too, I've kept their email addresses. And a couple of them I'm actually friends with on Facebook and Twitter. Oh, lovely. Yeah, that's so cool. Because now it looks like you've made new friends out of it too. Yeah. <laughs> we like friendship. <laughs> Especially in the writing community. <laughs> yeah, proper proper support. Yeah, one like, actually emailed me the other day just to share a, a YouTube video he'd found out, he'd done that I thought he'd thought I'd like. <laughs> so. Oh, perfect. <laughs> That's really cool because I have been on ACX before. Um, not too long after we started the podcast, I went on this little, I don't know, I went on this little phase that I was like, oh, because when I was little, I always wanted to be a voice actor. And so shortly after we started the podcast, I was like, oh, I could totally do this. And I found ACX and I actually almost auditioned for a couple of different books. And I actually saw one of your books on there, Tori, and I almost auditioned for it. And then I chickened out. I might have <laughs> I've never done it you. before. <laughs> I might have considered you. It depends on which book it was. I mean, I might have considered you. I, yeah, I just, I saw it and I was like, oh, do I, don't I? And then I, I kind of chickened out, but maybe someday <laughs> I'll give it a shot just to see what happens. <laughs> well, you, your voice would work for it, it if that helps any. Oh, that does. <gasps> there you go. There you go. You should at least try it. You know, all they could say is no. So. Yeah, that <laughs> is true. That's true. That is a good point. But it's such a whole different world, too. Especially, as I just said, I don't really listen to audiobooks. So I'm like, can I really narrate for an audiobook when I know absolutely nothing about audiobooks? Well, the main thing to remember when you're narrating is you want to just speak clearly when you're reading the stuff out so you know you speak clearly on microphone so you could potentially do it wow okay because i i mean if you've heard me on the podcast i'm always <laughs> this is how i speak <laughs> i listen we edit <laughs> like that's the thing yeah <laughs> lots and lots of takes <laughs> true but it doesn't matter how many takes I mean, the, when you're narrating an audiobook, you get given a certain amount of time, depending on the length of the project, to complete it in. And um, some people are more generous than others. Personally, I give quite a long time because then it gives plenty of time for people to do it and redo it until they're happy with it before they have to submit it to me. Oh, right. Yeah. Oh, that's yeah. nice. Just out of curiosity. When you were saying about the auditioning, how how does that work? Do you like have like um, sections of your book and they read that and then like is it is it up and they just yeah. read it and then send you the audio? Is that how it's done? Um, I put up a sample, and they will then read that sample um, and upload their audition to the page for that book. And then I will listen to the sample and decide if I'm happy to go with them or not. If they are somebody who I like for it, but I wonder if they can do a specific thing, like um, one person I liked, but I needed them to be able to pronounce a certain word properly um, because of using some Welsh in one of my books. <laughs> oh, wow. <laughs> um, so... Uh, I had to, I actually contacted them and said, I like you for this, but can you do that? Um, it turned out that he couldn't. But then um, I said to him, well, since I like you, I'd like to consider you for one of my other books. And I had him do something else then afterwards. With some, I just sent him something that I knew was suitable for his style. Oh, wow. That's kind of, that's kind of cool. <laughs> but um, basically they upload the scripts uh, that they've read from the sample that you put up mm -hmm. um which if you aren't sure if you think it could be done a couple of ways you can upload several a couple onto the same file or even audition a couple of times um and then the person considers them and picks their favorite and offers their favorite the job of doing it 
and then um, you can give them a deadline um, to send a 15 minute sample first mm -hmm. which with some of my children's book actually meant that it, they got two chances to narrate the whole book because some of them are, are slightly less than the 15 minutes anyway <laughs> um, but after that um, they send you the sample and you can tell them if there's anything that you want changed mm -hmm. one of the narrators that I got um, to be friendly with um, one time she wanted her daughter to be involved because her daughter was interested so she actually uploaded two samples um, for me to listen to for me to choose between the two mm -hmm. Um, but she did it without actually telling, saying it was ready. She just messaged me to tell me, have a look at these and see what you like best so that we could decide which one for her to submit for the official sample. Right. Oh, that's cool. And I actually did end up going with the one with the child in it. Oh. <laughs> I mean, yeah, what, what better way to narrate a children's book as a child? <laughs> well, I think that's great. A uh, ten-year-old did a fairy impression for me. Oh, that's cool. I, li I like the idea that that narrator almost thought outside the box a little bit. I yes. thought, oh yeah, we could try that, and, and but obviously, you know, gave you two options so that you didn't feel like it was just actually uh, yeah. something at you that you didn't want. And she asked me if it was fine first, which I like it when they think outside the box. Some people don't. Yeah. But I like it because it adds potentially good things to the story. And if I don't like it, I can always say, no, I don't want to go down that route. Yeah. Right. Yeah. But also it shows you that they're passionate about it as well. Like yes. they're not just looking at your book as another job for them. They're like, oh, I really want to make like, this is a good book. I really want to make the audiobook strong. Yes. You can sometimes great. tell by the way that they do the sample um, because a lot of them will just like, yeah, okay, I'm reading this sample kind of thing. Yeah. And it's like, yeah, okay, you obviously don't really care enough to even put some inflection into your voice, so forget it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm going to ask probably a stupid question, but obviously the main aspect of an audiobook is the narration. So would you say that finding a narrator is the hardest or maybe the longest part of creating an audiobook? Um, it's the hardest, but not the longest. The longest, although I suppose it's the longest for the author, but the longest is actually waiting for the narrator to um, do the work. Because obviously from my point of view, once the narrator has been chosen, I just sit back and wait for them to give me the sample and then I need to listen to that and give feedback. And then I just sit back and wait for them to send the next thing over. Oh, gotcha. So it's just like a long waiting process. <laughs> and there's a lot of waiting. <laughs> but it's worth it at the end. Yes. When you're done creating the audiobook and you're ready to publish it, what is the publishing process like? Is it similar to publishing your ebook or even a like paperback version? Or is it like how different is it? It's not really all that different. Um, the difference really is if you're going through something where you're dealing with the narrator through that site, then um, you already have most of it on its way to publication by the time you're submitting the final product. Um, because once you submit that final product to review by um, ACX or whoever, um, that is essentially giving them permission to publish it. So then you just literally wait for it to become available at the retailers and then start telling everyone to buy it. But if you've got the files that you've done it another way and you're uploading them to the site yourself, um, which I know is an option with some places, mm -hmm. then it's exactly the same as with your eBooks and paperbacks because you just literally upload the file, wait for it to go through the system and start sharing your links. Oh, okay. So it, it sounds easy as one, two, three, almost. <laughs> it sounds easy. <laughs> it, well, yeah, it sounds yeah. easy. <laughs> You've published a book, you know, it's not quite as easy as it sounds. Right. No, I, I know. But like, it's, <laughs> it's 
sounds like you just do a file swap instead of doing a Mobi. File. Yeah, basically, yeah, instead not. of um, getting your ebook file and uploading that, you just um, w- accept, approve the things that they've uploaded or upload your um, MP3 file and just do it that way, basically, instead. So it's really just the files you're working with that's different. Oh, okay. So, you know, kind of going back to our first question where we said, do you think everyone should create an audiobook? It sounds like if you are able to self-publish your ebook or paperback, hardcover, whatever, like you should be able to do an audiobook. I mean, oh yes, definitely. Yeah, bit of a learning curve at first, but if you're able to do one thing, you can definitely do another. Yes, especially since with things like ACX having royalty share, there's not even the excuse of finances. Ah, oh, that's True. a good point. I have to say, I I think it's one of those things where I went into the concept of audiobooks assuming it was this really daunting process. Like really, you know, as in like when you publish, get yourself an ebook, get yourself a paperback, maybe a hardback. Again, I'm doing that thing where I am not a big fan of hardbacks, but I know other people are, so I should stop thinking like that. Like everyone is exactly like me. <laughs> But it was always that kind of in the back of my mind, in my list, it was always going to be like, right, you know, I'll definitely do an ebook, I'll do a paperback, probably a hardback, and an audiobook eventually, because it felt like it was going to be this really different thing. And then listening to you talk about, you know, the, the platform that you use, how you pick your narrator, how they do the audition, it's made me go, oh, hardly what I thought it was. <laughs> Yeah, it's really not that difficult, especially if you've had some experience listening um, just to people in general. Um, You don't even have to be um, somebody who listens to audiobooks a lot. But if you've had experience listening to people in general, so you know the kind of tones that you want for your character. Mm, Yeah. um, Then that should be enough for you to be able to choose a good narrator for your book. So you can, when you hear the auditions, you can know that's not right for the part. So um, that's actually the most complicated part from the author's point of view is choosing your narrator. Have you ever, have you ever had like two or three narrators who would all be really perfect for the book and it's been really difficult to sort of like narrow it down? Yes, I have (laughs) a couple of times. (laughs) Luckily, at the time, I was doing my books like in batches. So the ones that um, I didn't give that job to, I said, well, I'm not giving you this job, but I've got this other book and you'd be really great for that because it's a similar kind of style. Would you please do this one? <laughs> oh, that is so nice. See, you're always like looking out for all these other people. Oh, Yeah, I do like that. You're still giving everybody a fair shot if you really like them or you're just pocketing their email address for another time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean, there are some people that I've listened to their auditions and I'm like, oh my God, you should not be narrating books. <laughs> <laughs> Is it the sort of people that, you know, they'd probably be reading out a manual for like a, a no, I, freezer I, kind of level? <laughs> I, actually, there's worse than that. Oh gosh! <laughs> there was somebody who, even in the like two minute audition, I almost fell asleep. Oh my! That's not a good sign. <laughs> not a good sign. I mean, useful for the fact that I sometimes have trouble falling asleep, but not really for my book. <laughs> I know sometimes people have audio books on for children as bedtime stories, but I don't want them to fall asleep because of that. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, that, oh. that's true. <laughs> it's probably like anything. There's always some people who think, "Hey, this is a quick money-making thing," and not thinking that it's like a lot of things. You, you not everyone is is perfect for every type of job, and some people are just not, you no. know, not great. I mean, they could learn. You know, some people have said if they don't put any inflection in, if they don't put voices, if um, if they need to. You know, I can I can appreciate if they didn't know. Some people think that they have to speak correctly and just keep the tone exactly the same, and that. But maybe if they learned, but others where it's just like that is how they speak, and you're like, no, just no. Yeah, exactly. 
Uh, I did have uh, another one that I was kind of disappointed with because she was really uh, great in the audition and did voices and everything. And then she did the final thing and she didn't do the voices. And I said, well, what happened? And she said, oh, well, I didn't know I was supposed to do voices. I said, well, can you do it with voices? Oh, no, she says, I don't do voices. What the? <laughs> so she, she literally just wanted the job for to get the money, and that was it. Yeah. Ooh. It's awful. But because she'd done the book, um, I couldn't, there wasn't really a reason for breaching the contract. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, um, so oh. I kind of had to go with her, but I, needless to say, I didn't use her for any more of my books. Yeah, that's yeah. Sad. Jeez. It's like false advertising. If she did, uh, if she did voices during the audition, that's what you expect you're going to get. So Exactly. Mm. But then at the other end of the scale, I had one that um, I hadn't said anything about voices, but she heard that the, the um, main character of the story was the Westie. So she did this great <laughs> Scottish accent for the dog. And I'm like, you know what? You've got the job. <laughs> that. It's so cute. Obviously went all in. <laughs> yes. <laughs> that was one of the times I did not need to think about which one I wanted for it. <laughs> yeah, that's good. I'm sure you, you get so much relief when you get that kind of audition in and you're like, oh, okay, this project's done. <laughs> Yeah, because she actually wrote in her notes, because you can write a note when you submit the audition. She actually wrote, I know you didn't say anything about an accent, but I thought that the dog should probably have a Scottish one because, you know, Westy. Um, so if you don't want me doing that for the actual book, then say so. And I was like, I want you doing that for the book. <laughs> Please do it. <laughs> oh, that's oh, that is Oh, I, I love that, though, as you said, uh, where it's, it's, people have obviously got a passion for it as well. Yes. Oh, okay. Honestly, this this conversation has totally changed my thoughts on audiobooks. I I was looking at them with that kind of side eye of Ooh, it's it's a really hard thing to think of, and is is it would it work for my stories? And now listening to how fun it sounds doing some of this and like meeting these people who, who with you know who, who uh, audition and everything. I don't know. I'm. Eventually, when I finish the goddamn book, I think I might actually have to try that pretty quick. Yeah, it, it's like a whole new world. Because I thought I thought the same thing as you, Ari. I thought it was going to be this the most difficult process. And I, I don't know why people think like that. I don't know why we think that it's so difficult. I mean, we write books. Like, that, that's difficult in and of itself. I'm pretty sure we can put together an audiobook. But then I found ACX, and I was like, this they have a thing for this, <laughs> which I don't know why they wouldn't, but I was like, oh, this, this looks so much like simpler than I thought it was. It's definitely, I thought it was going to be more complicated, to be honest. When I first started, I was like, oh God, and I've got to go through over 50 of these. <laughs> oh, well, maybe I'll try a couple of them and see how it goes. If I don't like doing it, I just won't make everything available in audio. And actually, I was doing them in batches as one lot was published, the next lot went up for audition. Um, uh, oh, and I was doing yeah. this while in and out of hospital. What my neck. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, a couple of years ago, Rachel, when I was in and out of hospital having blood transfusions? Yes, I do. Yeah, I was doing it in between hospital trips then. Oh my god. Oh, so, so not like a, a quick hospital trip, a blood transfusion hospital. Tori, seriously, you're making us feel bad. We barely do stuff and we're not, you know, dealing with health issues and, and that. It's, it's, oh called it's called practice. It's called practice. But no, you know seriously, what? Seriously, it's, it is, it's just practice. I've had to all my life and you just kind of get used to it. But you know what, that's what I love about you is that you just you just take the punch and you're like, you know what, this is it. And I'm not going to let it slow me down. And I'm just going to keep doing what I want to do. I love that. That's the only way I'm going to get to do anything. So. <laughs> See, I feel like we take the punch, fall down and cry a lot. We need to stop doing that. <laughs> I didn't yeah. say I don't cry a lot. <laughs> <laughs> you just get stuff done. I, I can cry later when nobody's watching. 
Oh, don't say that. It's okay to cry. It's okay to cry. <laughs> Honestly, you, you, you're making me feel very motivated and also a little bit shamed that I should have done more by now. <laughs> In a good way. We still want you back on. <laughs> like part of the reason we have guests on is because like you guys motivate us to get our butts in gear (laughs) and it's like Ari and I we think so much alike and then we have a third person come in and we're like oh yeah we could do that we should be doing things this way (laughs) so thank you to Ari stuff at their own pace well that's true too that is we're we're really slow paced. <laughs> I want to be though. Kind of, I want fifty books out there. That sounds great. It sounds very tiring, but it also sounds so great. <laughs> can I can I just ask Tori just out of curiosity? Because I know you said you have your books as ebooks, paperbacks, and audio books. Do you find that one of those platforms performs better than the others, or is it kind of like even across the board? Um, it actually varies because sometimes I get a load of audiobook sales and nothing from anything else. And then another time I'll sell a bunch of ebooks and that's it. Another time I'll sell a couple of paperbacks and that's it. So it just varies. Right. So de- it definitely suggests that if we want to be, you know, what is a picket word? If we want to do better as writers, then having that kind of multiple platform. No, but that platform's not the right word, is it? Uh, having that multiple formats is the best way because otherwise you are you would you would be missing sales if you hadn't got audiobooks, if you hadn't got ebooks, then when you had those sales spikes, you would have missed them. Exactly. So what made me start doing paperbacks is that someone said, Well, I would get your book, but it's not available in paperback. So I said, Okay, I'll do paperbacks then. That was actually more difficult than the audiobooks. <laughs> really interesting um yeah getting the covers done um if i'd been able to um either um do it myself Mm -hmm. or um know someone who had had a lot of experience doing it before themselves it wouldn't have been so bad but the person who was helping me um he was actually new to the process too and he was doing it to me following the instructions that I gave him that somebody had given me um, as a favor to me. So it it took several attempts for us to get it right. But once we finally figured out the system and managed to figure out how to work it, it started to be a lot quicker. Right, yeah. The more formats you've got out, the more chance you've got of sales because that way you've got the format that works for the person because everyone's got their own preferences right yeah i mean it's the variety people people like choices it's like i i I will always gravitate towards paperbacks um i find reading on a screen i can only do that so long because I, i work on a screen all day and i write on a screen and everything and by the end of the day, if I want to read, my eyes are often hurting. So I like a paperback over, a, over like a Kindle screen. Um, so, yeah, and I don't like hardbacks because I find them really awkward to hold. I like to sit holding with one hand and drinking a cup of tea in the other. So and a big, huge um, hardback doesn't work. So I always gravitate towards paperbacks. So, yeah, if I'm looking for a book and it isn't in paperback, I won't often get an ebook or, or a hardback or an audio book, I, I will often sort of like home and on. And only if I really think, yes, this book sounds great, will I go out of my comfort zone and get a different one. So yeah, I suppose if you have all of them, then you're catching everybody. It's one big exactly. giant net. Yes. <laughs> it's a book shaped net. <laughs> book shaped net. <laughs> That's the process for creating and publishing an audiobook. It's a lot simpler than it sounds and even though it's a learning curve but you should definitely do it give your readers more of a variety of your books and just have it have your book be more accessible to everybody um tori again thanks so much for joining us today did you want to tell our listeners a little bit about yourself Yeah, um, I'm a blind vegan p- 
Welsh-born poet and children's author. And um, I write a lot of books. I publish everything I write, um, whether that's a good idea or not. And um, spend way too much time blogging. But where I do a um, segment for where I interview writers' pets um, with with my own pets. I think that's great. Chip is on there somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> yes, he is. <laughs> <laughs> Tori's links and bio will be in the description below. So please be sure to go check out her website, her blog, her books, all that fun stuff and give her some love. And we hope you guys enjoyed this episode. Do let us know if you've published or even listened to audiobooks in the comments or on Twitter using the hashtag The Merry Writer Podcast. And if you want to get some extra content, you can head on over to our Patreon page at patreon.com forward slash The Merry Writer Podcast. You can support our show for as little as $1 a month and get some extra bonus content. So tune in next week for another episode of The Merry Writer Podcast where we ask all the right questions. Thanks for listening. Bye. 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 This podcast is brought to you by Scribbled Notes. Our handwriting is awful. The music titled Inspired is by Kevin McLeod, licensed under Creative Commons 4.0.